Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning for the pre-proposal webinar for the alternate shelter RSP. Um, this is Kimberly Howard. I'm a project manager with the Homeless Services Division at the Department of Family and Support Services. Um, and you will also be hearing today from Tom Mose and Julia Talbot from DFSS. So I'm going to pass over to Tom to do some quick housekeeping before we get started. Hi, everyone. This is Tom Mose. I'm a program development coordinator and I work at the Department of Family and Support Services. I help out with the technical issues and aspects of all the webinars for our department and just want to let you know due to the volume of participants joining us today everyone's been placed on mute um, we'd like you you have a control panel for your dashboard that we want you to please submit questions via the question box and we'll respond to the questions after going through the slides and there may be time that we'll uh, answer questions uh, after Kim's presentation and then again after Julia's presentation in that order and then please use the question box to notify us of it, any technical issues and I'll do my best to respond to you while I'm controlling the PowerPoint slides for Kim and Julia and just lastly uh, while I go on to the next slide before Kim comes back and does a welcome and introductions again that we are uh, recording this webinar and it will be made available to you uh, and Julia will go over how that will be made available to you al along with the copy of the PowerPoint presentation. But we do have a DFSS YouTube channel and I'll be posting a recording link on there. So if you Google Department of Family Support Services YouTube channel, uh, the recording should be made available in the next day or two um, for you to view or share with your team. Thank you, and I'll pass it back to Kim. Great. Um, so on our agenda today, um, welcome and intros. Again, this is Kimberly Howard, Project Manager with the FSS. Um, and I will be walking through sort of the purpose of this RFP, some background, um, as well as sort of the program models. Um, and some of the details on facilities and selection criteria and timeline. Um, and then I will pass it over to Julia Talbot to walk us through their technical assistance for actually submitting the application in the e-procurement system. Um, and we'll pause for questions sort of after, the, after my section and then after Julia's section um, so we can make sure we're all on the same page. So let's go ahead and get started. So the purpose of this RFP, um, DFSS is seeking shelter operations to manage and staff alternate shelters for individuals experiencing homelessness to support the continued decompression of the existing shelter system in response to COVID-19. Um, we are envisioning that these alternate shelters will operate for a six month period, beginning September 15th of this year with an option to extend depending on continued need for shelter decompression. We're seeking programs that will provide a safe and accessible place to stay for people experiencing homelessness, can follow public health guidance to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in these facilities, um, and support clients in moving toward permanent stable housing. Next slide. So a little background of um, how we got here. Um, so as we all know, um, households experiencing homelessness are an especially vulnerable population um, in this COVID-19 crisis. Um, many experiencing homelessness are living in shared facilities, meaning that they're interacting with more people, and also people experiencing homelessness are more likely to suffer from underlying conditions that make them more vulnerable to serious illness if they contract COVID-19. So throughout this crisis, DFS has been working with um, partners to decompress the existing shelter system to allow for safe social distancing within our existing system. Um, and we did this by opening five alternate shelter facilities, as well as supporting the relocation of high-risk residents in congregate settings to individual hotel rooms for shielding. DFSS is also investing significantly in rapid rehousing resources um, in support of the COC's expedited housing initiative um, which will quickly move clients out of shelter and into stable housing, um, su supporting the decompression of our existing shelter system. So at this stage of the crisis, 
uh, DFSS is currently transitioning our temporary beds um, out of sort of the five alternate shelter facilities um, into facilities with smaller rooms um, to support implementation of CDPH guidance, and um, specifically sort of this idea of cohorting um, rather than having um, a bunch of folks in a large congregate space. And we're working closely with CDPH um, as we have throughout this crisis um, to figure out what is what is the timeline um, that we need to continue decompression. At this point, CDPH has recommended we need to maintain shelter decompression through at least March of 2021. So um, again, DFS is seeking applicants who can quickly assume the management and daily operations of these alternate shelter programs no later than September 15th. Um, and work closely with DFSS and other city partners um, to do so. And in addition to sort of the existing alternate shelter programs, we're seeking applicants to provide additional temporary beds in other respondent proposed facilities um, to supplement sort of overall capacity in our system. Next slide. So the Specifically, um, we have sort of a few shelter models that we're requesting in this RFP. Um, so based on the COC projections of households to be served through the expedited housing initiative um, project and projections of, sort of shelter demand, um, DFS is estimating a need to maintain capacity for roughly 650 beds at alternate sites over the next six months, um, specifically to serve single adults and families experiencing homelessness. So we're really seeking three program models here. Um, model A is an alternate shelter um, with the ability to start at 200 beds um, and scale up depending on need um, to serve single adults in either a city-owned facility or in an applicant proposed facility of sort of equivalent size. Model B um, is a, we're looking for a temporary shelter program um, to serve 200 uh, people, single women, and families with children at either a city-owned facility or an applicant-proposed facility of comparable size. Um, based on the sort of shelter demand that we're currently seeing, we're anticipating that this might be mostly for single women, um, but looking for a provider um, that can serve both single women and families with children and can have some flexibility um, to meet uh, demand depending on sort of the, the number in each of those subpopulations. And then lastly, Model C is sort of the supplemental um, shelter program at applicant proposed facilities. And so DFSS is aiming to fund at least 115 additional beds in this category um, and ask that each program applying is providing a minimum of 50 beds. Um, and this would be for single adults and families with children or single adults or families with children. Um, the last, sorry, last, one last note on that slide um, is that 115 additional beds uh, could vary depending on sort of responses that we get for Model A and Model B. Thanks. Next slide. So as we all know, um, none of us can sort of predict the future with this COVID crisis, um, and so we are really seeking applicants who can work closely with DFSS um, and other city partners to respond to changing need, um, both in terms of time frame, number of beds, um, and sort of po the population served, um, and specifically looking for partners who can quickly scale up um, on the time frame and adapt operations in response to the pandemic, and then also scale down um, when necessary. Next slide. Okay, so what are we actually asking um, in terms of services? Um, DFSS is seeking applicants with the ability to deliver the following essential services for our target population of households experiencing literal homelessness. Um, we're looking for programs that are open 24-7 um, and can provide a safe environment um, and sort of basic needs, whether that's including meals and kitchen access or kitchen access. Um, showers, toiletries, limited storage. Um, we're also looking um, for programs that can implement CDPH guidance to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in the facilities, um, engage in diversion efforts, 
either through sort of coordination with system-wide diversion efforts or by use of creative problem-solving conversations with clients to rapidly access them back to housing, um, as well as providing connection to housing options through the coordinated entry system housing assessment or sort of supporting clients in identifying and navigating other housing options. Um, we're looking for programs to provide case management to ensure clients are linked to services and community resources that will help clients obtain or maintain housing, such as employment, healthcare, uh, legal uh, support. Um, and lastly, sort of unique um, a, a new need that's certainly been uh, heightened through the COVID crisis is we're looking for partners who can work closely with a medical partner um, to provide on-site medical consultation and follow up with clients. Um, as well as who can coordinate with sort of existing testing efforts. Next slide. And we also ask that um, the alternate shelter proposals reflect the core values of the Chicago continuum of care, um, particularly a housing first approach um, that anyone experiencing homelessness should be able to access shelter without prerequisites as well as access permanent housing options um, as quickly as possible. A harm reduction approach um, that shelters are taking practical and proactive strategies to reduce the harm that participants may choose for themselves um, rather than sort of enforcing sobriety or other behavioral requirements um, and making sure that staff are trained to de-escalate conflicts and to prevent um, those harms. Um, also, trauma-informed care, um, that shelter leadership understands the wide impact of trauma on participants, and staff members are trained to recognize and respond to um, signs and symptoms of trauma in clients. Um, and lastly, inclusion of persons of lived experience um, input in uh, the program model design um, and implementation through uh, board member participation, advisory councils, or collection of uh, client feedback to inform service delivery. Next slide. So uh, one of the sort of unique parts of this RFP um, is that we are seeking uh, applicants through Model A and Model B to operate alternate shelters in city-owned facilities. So these facilities are owned by uh, the Board of Education, by CPS, um, and are currently being used by the city of Chicago under an intergovernmental agreement. Um, so the selected respondents for Model A and Model B, if uh, applying to operate in one of these city-owned facilities, will be required to enter into a lease um, with the city of Chicago Department of Assets, Information, and Services, um, which I will refer to as AIS. Um, and included in that lease, which will be a no-cost lease for the delegate, is water, gas, and other utilities, um, although not internet services. These sites will have refrigerators, beds, including uh, mattresses um, and pillows, an initial supply of linens, so towels, um, sheets, uh, laundry machines, some tables and chairs, and garbage cans. Um, and AIS will also manage facility maintenance, waste disposal, and pest control services. We're also asking that respondents who are applying to operate in a city-owned facility should provide a supplemental pricing proposal for janitorial services, security services, and snow removal. And depending on sort of competitiveness of pricing here, DFSS may choose to include this in the total award for the selected respondent. Um, and also will determine if there needs to be a transition period in providing these services between AIS and the, and the funded agency. Um, and I will just note that uh, these supplemental proposals are not part of the scoring of, of applications. Um, a couple other important notes on these facilities. Uh, sites are set up for internet connection, but don't have phones or computers or landline connection. Um, and they're also not equipped for meal preparation on site. So the site does not have any cooking appliances, cookware, utensils, dishes, silverware, um, no like microwaves um, or anything like that. Um, and so the way that this is currently operating is that meals are being delivered through a contracted agency. Um, and so uh, the selected agency and DFSS uh, can, can talk about transferring over that contract um, or the respondent can propose an alternate solution. Next slide. 
Um, and so before I sort of uh, give a very quick overview of uh, the actual sites. I will note that these specific sites are still pending final approval, um, but DFSS is offering site visits at these facilities tomorrow. Um, so for Model A, um, the city-owned facility for single adults, um, that site visit is tomorrow at 10 a.m., um, and that is at Calumet High School at 8131 South May Street. Um, where you will meet with me and the lovely Christine Riley um, to take a quick tour of that facility. Um, and then tomorrow afternoon um, is the site visit for Model B, which is the city-owned facility for single women and families with children um, at the Young Women's Leadership School um, at 2641 South Calumet Ave. To register in advance um, for these site visits, please email the DFSS um, email at DFSS dash homeless at cityofchicago.org by no later than tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Um, and please give us the names and contact information of who will attend. Um, we're asking for sort of safety reasons that we limit attendance to no more than two people per agency per site and that visitors must wear a mask. Okay, next slide. Um, for those applying for any of the models but uh, proposing your own facilities, um, just know that as normal, maintenance of the proposed facility will be the responsibility of the awarded agencies and these facility costs should be included in the proposal. Okay, um, so the next few slides walk through uh, the selection criteria um, for this RFP, um, starting with strength of proposed program. Um, before we get in, um, I will just note that respondents should submit one application per program model. Um, so if someone is interested in applying for both um, operations of Model A and for through their own proposed facility through Model C, those should be submitted as separate applications. Um, and so in terms of strength of proposed program, we've walked through sort of some of the essential elements and, and core values. Um, DFSS is seeking programs that can demonstrate that they will provide a safe environment that's open 24-7, a place to sleep and provision of basic needs, uh, coordination with diversion efforts and with the coordinated entry system, as well as case management. Um, and also that programs uh, will demonstrate that they'll, they're designed in line with CDC and CDPH health guidance, including you know, maintaining social distancing, conducting regular health screenings, encouraging universal masking, um, having a plan for isolation of uh, clients with symptoms um, and coordination with medical partners for testing and ongoing support. And uh, we also are looking for programs that can demonstrate that they reflect the Chicago uh, COC's core values. Next slide. Um, so the next sort of bucket of selection criteria is performance management. Um, and DFS is seeking respondents with evidence of strong past performance against desired outcome goals. And um, so performance indicators um, include the percentage and number of households who exit shelter to permanent or more stable housing, um, average length of stay in shelter, uh, the percent and number of households with complete coordinated entry assessment, um, as well as bed utilization. Um, and DFS um, will require that the awarded agency um, enters data into HMIS, um, so is seeking respondents with experience tracking and reporting program outcomes accurately in HMIS. Next slide. Great. Um, the third bucket of selection criteria here is organizational capacity. Um, so DFSS seeks respondents that can demonstrate an ability to maintain a safe shelter environment, um, demonstrated by staffing qualifications and a staffing plan that is appropriate for the facility. Um, especially in sort of the city-owned facilities, we're looking for very clear plans of how applicants will manage security and staffing, um, especially with the uh, possibility of mixed populations, as well as the sort of good partners and neighbors in the community. Um, we're also seeking applicants who can demonstrate an ability to scale staffing and assume operations on the proposed timeline of uh, assuming operations by September 15th, um, as well as scale down once temporary operations end. Um, and lastly, can demonstrate uh, expertise working with people experiencing homelessness 
and accommodate these capabilities and infrastructure in place to meet the needs of the population. Next slide. Um, and lastly, um, in the cost and budget bucket of the selection criteria, um, DFSS seeks respondents that can demonstrate fiscal capacity to implement the proposed program, including the ability to expend funds prior to reimbursement, as well as a reasonable budget and a clear rationale for budget decisions. Um, and also, the city will require that selected respondents participate in contract negotiations. Um, which is sort of especially relevant um, for those proposing to operate in city-owned facilities. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is just a reminder of um, attachments to submit um, with your RFP. Um, please do not forget to attach um, liability insurance, board member identification, SAM certificate, certificate of good standing, bylaws and articles of incorporation, financial statements, city of Chicago compliance, acknowledgement, conflict of interest, and IRS determination letter. Um, and as I've already mentioned, if applying to operate at a city-owned facility, respondents must submit this supplemental pricing proposal, which will not be part of, of the scoring of applications. Um, and please, in your organization's budget, um, make sure that all program requirements outlined in the RFP are addressed, um, including meals and supplies. Next slide. Um, and so a quick reminder on timeline. So the pre-proposal webinar is today. Site visits are tomorrow. Um, in order to be able to sort of answer all um, questions ahead of applications being due, um, the due date to submit pre-proposal questions is going to be August 5th, um, and then applications are due August 18th. Um, we're hoping to notify successful respondents by August 31st, um, and then the program period um, will begin September 15th, 2020. Next slide. Okay, so I will pause here um, for questions um so oh, yeah we we have hey kim this is julia um mm -hmm. we do have two questions already one was do we have to bring the medical partner or does dfss already have one um right okay i can i can start there um so in the rsp questions we will ask if you are already working with a medical partner um, which is, is slightly preferred, um, but it's not a requirement um, to be awarded. Um, if, if you do not already have a medical partner, um, we will sort of continue to work with CDPH and DFSS um, to make sure that that connection can happen for these sites. And then a second question, um, does that mean if we want landlines, we have to pay the phone company to install phone lines? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. That would have to be a conversation um, with AIS. Um, so I think this would have to be sort of part of the um, conversation around sort of budget um, with AIS uh, for selected respondents. Okay. Um, so that's all the questions that we have at this moment. Um, we, there will be an opportunity for additional questions at the end of the presentation. If nobody else has anything more right now, I'm going to just come go into my section and talk about how to manage your application in the e-procurement environment. And at that point, we'll have time to answer other programmatic and, um, you know, schematic questions about the about doing and. <laughs> about doing an application in e-procurement. Um, so yeah, so if there's not any, if there are not any other questions, I think we'll just continue here. So going on to the next slide, um, as we said, my name is Julia Talbot. I am a senior policy analyst here at the Department of Family and Support Services. I've worked here for a very long time. And my, my primary duties to the department are managing the RFP process we do a lot of RFPs every year. They're kind of, it's a highly technical 
not necessarily creative or, you know, not in the traditional sense of what most people think about it as creativity, but the, it's, a, it's a highly technical experience making an application to the department. I'm sure most of you, I'm looking at the names of the people on attending, I think most of you have some experience doing applications with us. So this will just be a, uh, a, a, a review of sorts. So um, my biggest my biggest thing that I like to say about making an application or for an RFP is to start early. The e-procurement system um, allows you to work at your own pace, but we, we cannot, one of, the, one of the things that we really can't do with the e-procurement is accept late applications. So once your application, uh, once that, that due date has made, has, has closed, we are not gonna be able to accept any late applications. We have to reopen it and repost it entirely new RFP and make everybody else who had applied prior apply again if we're going to do that. So I really encourage people to start early and I also encourage them to save often. Um, I've been We've been working in e-procurement for about three years now. I have never seen it crash. That being said, it doesn't necessarily get along with everybody's computer um, and it times out after about 10 minutes. So I what, even when I'm working in e-procurement, I save frequently. I save compulsively and um, it really works better that way for us all. Oh. So if you've never done business with the city of Chicago, you'll need to re register into the iSupplier e-procurement environment as soon as possible. There's some instructions at the end in a couple of slides as to how to do that. Give yourself five to seven business days for that registration to go through. What you'll do is you'll, you'll send in some information about your business. You will then press, you know, you'll, you'll send that to DPS, the Department of Procurement Services, and they will get back to you anywhere between 24, you know, hours and five business days later. We say five to seven, it usually seems to take about three. So don't wait, that's another reason to start early, don't wait till the last minute on this, especially if you need to do a new, if you're a new applicant. Um, one of the things when, just sort of behind the scenes, our RFP documents, I understand, are dense. They're not always necessarily the most interesting and exciting reads, you know, that you'll you'll ever do. They they really are not going to take the place of a good mystery or a romance novel or even something, you know, more more weighty. But they do have a lot of information in them, um, and they all connect. So the application questions that we develop directly relate to the the evaluation criteria in the RFP, and that directly relates to the RFP narrative and scope. So if you're looking at a question, you're like, I just don't know what they're, what, where they're really going. I don't really understand what they're after. Remember to read the RFP because chances are we have articulated what we are looking for, or you'll be able to get a sense of kind of what direction we want to, we want to go in. And, um, and then you know use that information for guidance and formulating your answer. That's where the real creativity of this process comes in in writing an application is looking at you know the sort of all of the things that we're looking to get done, but like you get to figure out how that gets done and and that's and that's really how you know how that gets done is is how we you know is what we really are looking at when we're reading applications. Um, again review the selection criteria. The selection criteria is what we build our, eva our evaluative instruments off of. So each application question is gonna relate to a bullet in the selection criteria specifically. And that's how we, you know, we do figure out, we, we do wait, that's how we kind of, you know, evaluate the, your application is how well did you answer the question in relationship to what we're looking to in the selection criteria, which is connected to that scope narrative. And that's, you know, that's sort of, if you're, that's how, that's the difference between a good answer and a bad answer is sort of like how much does your answer satisfy the, you know, the best case scenario of the selection criteria. So basically when you are answering your, applic answering your application questions, you'll be answering it into a sort of a text box that's referred to as a quote value. Um, there's a 4,000 character limit, limit per quote value, which includes punctuation and spaces. Each response is allotted 4,000 characters. It's not 4,000 characters for your entire application, although that would be a very short application. Um, the system isn't gonna 
count those responses for you. It just sort of cuts it off. So we really do recommend that you offer, that you write your response in like a Word document, that you do your, your whole application, in fact, in a Word document, and do the character limit counts in that context, cut and paste it up into e-procurement. The other thing is once you submit your application, it goes into the e-procurement system, and I don't think there is a way for you to access what you have done. So, so in, es in essence, you really want to develop a hard copy of your application so that you can refer to what you've submitted, because once you've submitted it to us, we can see it. Um, you can get a printable, you know, you can get a print copy off of e-procurement, but it's not going to save those answers in a format that you can really use it to build you know your own library of answers and i know every good grant writer has that you know has that library of answers that you want to be able to refer you know to to refer back to for the next application either to us or to somebody else so so just you know do yourself a favor and 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 develop your application into in in some sort of word processing and, and save it and then upload you know upload the answers into eprocurement um, eProcurement works best with the Internet Explorer browser. That being said, I have successfully used it on Chrome, with Chrome, with uh, Firefox. If your computer is having a hard time with eProcurement, you got it's just not getting you, they're they're not getting along, and you're getting kicked out a lot. You're having a lot of problems. Um, I would I would default to the Internet Explorer browser just just to see if that you know helps. Um, but again, just Try to, you know, save often. Um, we'll, I'm going to walk you through the submission process. You'll see it's not just a click and go kind of deal. You really have to go through a couple of screens. It's going to take a minute. Um, so just make sure, you know, you give yourself some time. This system really doesn't crash, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't suck up time and give you error messages or give you information that sometimes is hard to dis, to kind of interpret. Um, Another pro tip, don't use the back browser button on your on your browser. Um, that is something I have done and it never works out. What happens is once you click that back button on your browser, it will take you back. It just stops recording or it just stops recording any of the information that you put in after you put, use that back browser button. And so when you go to save, it will kick you out on a tech account. Like it will give you an error message and kick you out. When you go back in, nothing will have been saved. So scroll, you know, anything in blue can be used in e-procurement to get to something else. Use those buttons to navigate within the e-procurement environment or just save like at every screen. Um, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So here's some tips. If you, as Tim, Kim alluded to, if you need to submit multiple applications for a single RFP, you're going to need to set up a unique user account in iSupplier. So by a unique user account, you don't have to set up a different account for your business. You just need to set up like different accounts within your business. So it's like you have, you want to make three applications. And so one application is going to be su submitted by, um, you know, Mrs. Brady. And the second application is going to be submitted by Mr. Brady. And the third one is going to be submitted by Alice since they're the only people in that show that I think that we're over 21. Um, you can actually, um, you know, you want to have, you want to have separate email addresses and you need to, and they need to be active ones because if you have a problem, e-procurement is going to communicate with you through those emails addresses. So you should really be check, be able to check those email addresses. It will accept any old email address you put in there, but if you put a dead one in there and we're like, hey, this has been amended, hey, we have a problem, hey, you know, we want to, you know, like whatever, you know, you've been funded, you haven't been funded, like we have a question. If if you put in a dead email address that nobody ever checks, then we're not going to be able to communicate with you. It's both through e-procurement, but also if I need to get a hold of you or the program people need to get a hold of you, when we look in your ad, when we look in your application and when we see who submitted and we see the phone number and the email, that's really the only that's the only um, application, the information that we have about contacting you. And so if we can't get at you to ask you a question, then, you know, and you, because you're not checking that email or it's a bad number or whatever, you can put in those placeholders, but please don't because if we need to get a hold of you, we're not going to be able to. 
Um, one nice function about the e-procurement system is that you can actually submit early, and then if you want to draw that application back, you can do that. You can do it as many times as you want until the due date, in which case it's sucked away and you can't see it anymore. Um, I tell people as part of this, like avoid the rush, plan on the submission process taking 30 to 60 minutes. If it doesn't, you'll just be ahead of the game. I usually tell people, hey, try to submit the day before. It doesn't really matter how many people are trying to submit an application. The system is is um, really set up for that. I, we've had I've had I've had um, RFPs where literally almost 100 people are trying to submit, um, and their system doesn't. I don't think there's they they get they might get kicked out or something. But it's not e procurement is is ha is uh, built to handle that kind of a volume. So, but just give yourself time. Give yourself time because it just makes a stressful experience, a little bit less stressful. As I said, late applications won't be accepted. Um, and if you have questions, make use of the hotline, which is 312-744-HELP. Um, there is also a email address on the next slide, which is customer support at cityofchicago.org. You can also call me or email me uh, right now because everybody's working from home. If you call my phone number at work, it actually rings on my cell phone. So even if you call me at you know, Saturday night, chances are I'll probably pick up because I see the number and I'm just like, oh, it's my phone. I can't tell what our work calls and what are not, which also means that sometimes when I answer the phone, I just say hello, unlike my, what I would say at work. Um, please note that the hotline operates during business hours only, Monday through Friday, nine to five. I, um, you know, obviously if you call me, please don't call me in the middle of the night, but if you get a hold of me, I don't mind calling. I don't mind the after hours calls. Um, you know, that, that's just part of the part of the business. So save often, submit early. Uh, we're gonna go to the next slide that has some links to different, um, you know, different opportunities. So the DFSS webpage is a great place for people to find out what else we're releasing. So you can look to the DFSS section of our website. If you have questions about anything, you can do that customer support at cityofchicago.org or call the helpline that we talked about. And then finally, we have some actually really nice training materials like PowerPoint slides, uh, you know, screenshots, videos. If you're new to the system, you really like to look, you learn best from a video. So, um, that's how to get at them. I also have a lot of those things at my desk and I can send them to you if you are having problems with just, you know, some routine kinds of functions, how to log in, how to set up an account, you know, those kinds of things. And I'm there and the, and the helpline is there also to walk you through those things if you prefer a more personal hands-on approach. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna go through two functions that you'll actually need to know how to do. One is how to accept an amendment. Now we've already done an amendment for this because we needed to add that site visit information. And then the second thing that we're gonna, we'll go over after that is how to submit your application. So how to accept an amendment, we're gonna go to the first slide here and these are all screenshots. This is gonna be posted on uh, the webinar itself is recorded. The YouTube link, it's on the DFSS YouTube channel. The link is posted to the DFSS website. We'll post the YouTube link. Um, this webinar is also will become part of a second amendment, um, as well as all of the frequently asked questions or the questions that you're gonna answer and the questions that, that we have until, that I think we're accepting questions to like August 3rd. I, I'd have to check the date on that. But we'll keep, you know, we're gonna accept questions, then we're gonna do a big FAQ, answer to all your questions, and that will be posted in the second amendment. So here we go in terms of how to accept amendment. We posted our first amendment to this RFP yesterday. And so anybody who's trying to start an application is gonna to have to accept that amendment first. If you've already started an application, when you log back in, you'll be asked to accept the amendment and that the process of doing that will pull all of the information that you already had put into the system in terms of answers to questions or uploads or whatever. It will pull it into that amendment, amended RFP document. Um, as you can see, the real big picture point of the amendment process as far as the procurement the city of Chicago is concerned is that you understand that the RFP has been amended and you have mastery and knowledge over what the amendment says and that you, 
you understand that you will be held responsible for having mastery and knowledge over that amendment's content. Um, so that being said, you are going to have to acknowledge and accept your amendment to start your application. If the RFP, uh, in any case, in any case, to start an application, you're going to hit that create quote action and hit go. Um, if you want to just look at the amendment history, you can click on this bright blue view amendment history aspect, and this will, you know, this gets the party started. So you will either click the view amendment history, um, and then that will take you to this screen, this next screen, where you're going to start the process. So here, you're going to start the acceptance and acknowledgement process. You'll see underneath amendment history to be considered for award, you must acknowledge each amendment or submit or resubmit all your responses to ensure that they comply with the changes. Um, to look at the, RF, the amended RFP, the amended document, you're going to click, you would click on that document number. Um, to review changes, you would click on the little eyeglasses. Um, so each amendment has sort of like two components to it. One is a little box with a sort of synopsis of what the amendment's about. And then the other is an attached document that's usually entitled amendment or one or amendment two that will specifically outline the changes and you know it's a, a PDF document you'll download it and you can look at it. In this case the amendment that we just posted has the specific site information, um, you know where the sites are, how to RSVP, and then we have two appendices that outline the photos of the sites and some you know, information about those sites specifically. Those are in the those are both in the body of the amendment and those two um, you know, that information has also been PDF'd and uploaded as additional appendices. So you'll, you can get that information twice now um, off of the, our, the amended RFP. So after you have reviewed the changes and you feel comfortable, you're going to acknowledge the amendment by clicking on the Acknowledge Amendment button, which is either on the bottom right hand side or the top right hand side if you're feeling fancy. So let's go to the next slide. So after you hit the acknowledge amendments, it will take you to the next slide where you get to accept um, your, you know, you get to accept. So you're gonna turn, you're gonna click this like ridiculously small box about accepting the terms and conditions of the RFQ and that you acknowledge the changes made. And then you're going to click on the acknowledge button in the upper right hand corner, which will take you to the next slide, um, or the next screen in your case, which is a confirmation that you really, 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 really confirm that you know that you've read the amendment and you acknowledge it. And then you um, can say, you know, it says you may now respond to the negotiation because you are have demonstrated or you have attested to your mastery over the amendment. And um, then you hit yes. If you hit no, it will just take you back so that you can review more things until you feel confident. So you'll hit yes. And I believe that's really, let's see, next slide. We'll take you to the next screen which I believe is, um, let's see, is, oh, oh there's, I always, you know, I always forget, there's one more. We'll take you to these terms and conditions, which means you'll, you know, you're going to attest to the terms and conditions, finally. So you're going to then click this tiny box on the bottom saying you have read and accepted the terms and conditions, and then you're going to accept. So you know, the second to last box, the step five, you confirm your acknowledgement to the amendment. And now in step six, you're ex finally accepting the terms and conditioning, condition of the amendment. And now after you have accepted, you are done. Um, you can go on with your life and go on with your application. So that's how you're going to accept an amendment. Everybody gets to do that if they're interested in applying for this opportunity. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, now we're going to go on to the next slide or two and talk about how to submit an application in the e-procurement environment. So, you know, trotting right along. Oh, I didn't take that slide out. I got two how to submit applications just to give yourself, you know, extra preparation time. So when you're ready to submit an application, we're going to go to the next slide. Um, we're going to start by saving your draft one last time because you 
are like me, you can possibly save your draft and all the time in a procurement. And then you're going to click on the continue button, and that is going to take you, at that point, the uh, e-procurement system does like a whole scan of your application and uh, and says, hey, are you missing information? And if you're missing some information, then you, you um, are going to get an error message or in, you know, in the case, sometimes you get like six or seven error messages. The error messages will tell you what's going on. Um, I find them sometimes to be a little cryptic, but more or less, they usually always refer to some kind of a key. Word, and you can figure it out. But we're going to go through the two most common ones. In this case, the error message reads, you must quote at least one line in the RFQ. Uh, we'll go to the next slide to get a really look. So in this case, quoting a line in the RFQ means that you need to, um, for the purposes of the RFQ, we like to, we don't look, we don't actually evaluate what you put in the lines, but we do like you to put something in the lines because it makes us, it makes it easier for us to do a contract later. Um, and so quote at least on one line would mean you would go to the lines tab, which you can see is right underneath the error message in this case. And then you would then fill out, put a placeholder number in there. You can put any number in there. You can put one, you can put, I don't know if it would take a decimal, like a less than one decimal, but you really, I think can put any number in there. And um, you know, that would satisfy that error message. And then you, know, you would then hit continue. Again, it will run it and you'll see if you get rid of the error message. So, in this example, this next example, this is a different kind of error message, but equally an equally frequently experienced one. It's about an unanswered question in the application, which is cryptically referred to as the quote value, which is how what e-procurement calls answers, is required for requirement, which is what e-procurement calls application questions, and then first name. So the application question first name, which I think is self-explanatory, requires a quote value, which is sort of, you know, like you forgot to fill in your first name. It happens to everyone. Um, so then you would go in, you fill in your first name, and then you hit, you know, you hit save, and at some point you'll hit save, and then you'll go through the, you know, ready to con the con hit continue, and you'll stop getting error messages. At which point you can go on to the next uh, part of this, the application process, which is the review and submit. Um, so you know you. You hit continue enough and that your application doesn't have any errors, so now you're in review and submit. And this is the point where you can really review and submit, you, you can review your entire application. It's one really long sheet that you get to scroll down. Um, and so, and, and you can see the answers to all of your questions. You can see all the things that you've, all the attachments you've done. So if you go to the next slide, we can just show you, you uh, have a, a screenshot of that. So you can see the quote values. You can see this in this particular thing. We don't have the attachments, and we, you know there's no example of attachments, but they're up at the top here. Um, you can see everything. So you'll you're going to review your data, confirm that it's accurate. If you need to change it, you can change it at this point, and then you're going to scroll down to the bottom of the screen which is where you need to actually do the submission. So that's the next slide, is, the, what, is what the bottom of the screen looks like. Um, so we'll, there you go. So that's when you do your electronic signature. Um, pro tip here, don't check the box before you fill in the name and the title because that will get you, the system doesn't like that. Um, it, I'm particularly annoyed about this because it's like, well, the first thing is checking the box. But, you know, in the perfect world, the box should be at the bottom, but it's not. Uh, and I fall for it every time. So fill in your name, fill in the title, check the box, and then um, you can, I don't know why you'd want to save draft again, but you can. If we go to the next screen, I will show you how at the very end of that right-hand side column, um, you'll be able to see the little submit button, which I couldn't quite get in the screenshot and have the tiny, tiny printing make any sense to anybody. So you're going to, here's the submit button, you're going to submit, and then um, then you're done. So you'll get a confirmation.
So the confirmation, it used to be that the confirmation email was all you got from us, but now we have it so e-procurement will send you a confirmation email. Again, to multiple applications, make sure you have them linked to an email address that you are going to check. Um, that will happen within 24 hours of your submission. So if you are the kind of person that really just needs to know right away that your submission has been taken care of, that you have this confirmation, but you're just not sure or whatever, please feel free to call me or email me if you want me to look up. I can, I can see, after you submit, I can see it like within 30 seconds of your submitting, and I am more than happy to verify that you have submitted your application. That is totally cool by me. I totally understand, you know, we require a lot of our applicants. Our applications are, you know, it's a, it's a very dense and lengthy um, experience to make an application to us. We appreciate that you people make applications to us and, and want to do the work of the city on our behalf. And the least I can do is verify the fact that your application was in fact received as quickly as you would like to have that information. So that pretty much sums it up for what I have to say about e-procurement. Um, if you have questions about it, we can talk about them here. You can email me, you can call me. Um, I'm more than happy to. Um, I see here that we actually do have any number of additional questions um, that, that we can maybe start going down. We can, we can go into. Um, so now here, so I don't know if most of these are for you, Kim, but let me just start reading. Um, uh -huh. Julia, I see do you here, want to start with the... Are you... Pardon? Do you want to go ahead and start with the uh, one question that I think is, is for you of how long does it take for the I supplier to get approved for an agency? And then I can, I can go through sort of the remaining questions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, as I said, it takes, we say five to seven business days. My experience with iSupplier um, doing a new agency is sometimes it takes five to seven business days, but most of the time it's, it's more like one to three business days. You need to check, make sure that that email doesn't get into your spam though, because a lot of times that's exactly the kind of thing that spam like really loves. Um, but, but legitimately, the official answer is five to, you should expect five to seven business days. I would say make that application. If you haven't seen it after about three and you've checked your spam and it's just not there, maybe make a phone call, but give us at least three days, business days. Hi, this is Tom here, helping with technical assistance in case some people came on later and didn't hear uh, me introduce myself. I'm, work at DFSS and I work on these webinars with our division. Um, Julia, your audio sometimes went in and out, so maybe for the next set of questions, um, Kim can read them off and then she can answer them so we don't lose any audio. Does that sound good? Great. And okay, while so you're reading the Kim, if you don't mind me saying, while you're reading the questions, I'm going to go to the next slide just to uh, show everyone your, uh, your all your contact information so everyone will have it while you're reading the questions and answering them, okay? Perfect. Okay, so uh, first question I'm seeing is, are you funding new startup shelters? Um, so DFS is definitely open to new applicants. Um, and specifically just those who can demonstrate their strong performance against the selection criteria. Um, I think sort of the two pieces especially relevant um, there for new applicants um, would be sort of dem being able to demonstrate expertise working with the target population um, and also noting sort of the, the cash flow and uh, fiscal capacity um, to operate since uh, a DFS contract operates on a reimbursement basis only. Um, okay, the next question thing is, what do you recommend for new shelters um, that have, okay, so what do you recommend um, for helping the homeless population move toward permanent housing? Um, love this question. I think there's sort of three big components here. Um, one is sort of working within the existing system in the Chicago uh, COC 
Um, so we have the coordinated entry system, which will match clients to housing resources through the COC. And so making sure that clients are um, assessed for those resources as quickly as possible so that they're eligible for a match um, is really a key component here. Um, knowing that there's also sort of limited resources through our COC system, um, also having strong case management um, to support clients in identifying other options for housing, um, such as sort of staying with family and friends. Um, and lastly, I think a, a really key service that our um, shelter providers uh, provide for clients accessing housing is sort of helping them over some of the, the barriers to housing, um, such as you know, legal support with previous evictions or making sure all their documentation is in order. Um, this next question is, do you fund support services initiatives? Um, yes, in general, DFSS does. Um, for this RFP, specifically, we're seeking shelter operators um, who can operate a 24-7 operation, um, not just supportive services for clients. If our organization has a smaller space available, um, could we apply to fund that? Um, or do we need to use one of the two spaces you've identified? Um, great question. So respondents can propose their own facility. Um, and respondents who are hoping to do that should apply uh, under Model C. Um, so not, not everyone applying needs to use, uh, needs to propose to use one of the two city-owned facilities identified. Um, DFSS prefers that these programs um, being proposed at to respondent uh, proposed facilities have at least 50 beds, um, but we will still review uh, applications with, with fewer beds. Okay, um, next question I'm seeing is, are you interested in funding gender specific programs? Um, such as women's shelters. Um, and yes, DFSS is open to gender-specific proposals through this RFP, um, sort of depending on the applications we receive, DFSS will try to create a portfolio um, that meets the temporary need based on um, sort of the full portfolio of, of temporary shelters that uh, we're able to fund. Um, also, we'll note, you know, not just on uh, sort of gender, but if your organization wishes to layer in so specialized services for various groups um, within the broader target population. Um, you're welcome. You're welcome to do so. Okay. Um, have you mentioned what funds are actually available for this? Um, good question. I actually don't think I did. Um, so TMSS anticipates um, funding in the range of 500,000 to 700,000 per month across all of the selected agencies within this RFP. Um, and this funding will be sort of through CARES Act uh, funding. Um, one note on this, I think we want to really request that your agency propose um, what you think will actually cost um, to operate the program um, and select respondents and DFSS will engage in contract negotiations, um, which will be especially relevant for those proposing to operate in city-owned facilities. Um, are there specific target areas that you've identified as more in need? Um, so I, I, I think I'll, I'll answer this in, in one way and uh, please feel free to follow up if, if this is not the, sort of the intention of your question. Um, but specifically sort of through the need to decompress shelters, we saw the largest loss of beds for single adults and families um, just based on the facility setup. Um, in our system. So we're specifically seeking um, beds for uh, single adults and, and families. Um, please speak about what you require in the budget. Um, is there guidance in terms of request amount other than reasonable? Um, this is a great question. Um, so the budget form um, asks for sort of uh, specifics. Um, so I would refer you to look at um, the actual form to submit. Um, we definitely want to make sure that sort of budgets reflect all of the essential elements that are outlined under program requirements 
Um, so making sure that sort of budgets include staffing, supplies, meals, um, sort of all of the um, fundamental essential elements um, of a shelter program. Um, will there be additional funding um, after this year? So the term of um, the contract under this RFP will be from September 15th of this year to December of next year, um, but you'll see that funding will be released in periods of up to six months. Um, and that is sort of because of the reality of uh, operating in the COVID crisis um, with sort of many unknowns um, and so DFS will issue additional releases for funding um, if services are needed, um, and that sort of continued funding support will be dependent on uh, respondents' performance, the continued need for shelter decompression, um, and continued availability of funding. Um, this a question about specific geographic areas that are more in need of shelter service. Um, so in general, DFSS is seeking sort of shelter services to, to be available citywide. Um, in terms of the alternate shelters, I think those, uh, we don't have sort of a specific geographic area that we're uh, proposing. It'll, it's really more sort of within the context of where um, other alternate shelters are being proposed and where our existing um, system currently serves. Okay. Do you have a gender breakdown in mind for single adults, um, e.g. men versus women? Um, no, DFSS doesn't have a specific target here. Um, I think in general in our system we see sort of a greater need for single men. Um, but really, I think DFS is seeking a partner who could have flexibility um, in sort of adjusting to the the, the shelter demand um, that's coming in um, and, and sort of being able to serve um, those who can. I will say for um, the city-owned facilities, DFS is requesting that single men um, and single women be served on different floors. Um, and so there may be some sort of facility limitations um, that will, will influence some of that gender breakdown. When do we need to start the actual shelter? Um, so actual shelter operations, um, DFS is seeking applicants who can start on September 15th. Okay, I will give another minute um, in case there's other questions that are coming in. Did you answer the question about the uh, organization with smaller space, Kim? Yes, remind me, is that the, um, if an organization has a smaller space available, could we apply? Yeah, I, I'm, I didn't. Yes, okay. I did, but I'll, I'll quickly reiterate. Um, the answer is yes. Um, DFSS will review applications with smaller spaces, but our preference is for program um, applying in Model C that they provide at least 50 beds. Great. Oh, here's a new one. Uh, does Model B allow for single males as well? It says single women's families and children. Yes. Yeah. So, no, Model B um, is requesting a shelter just to serve. Uh, single women and families and with children. Um, if you're interested in uh, operating an alternate shelter for single men, um, I would encourage you to consider Model A um, or to apply through Model C. Um. Here we go. Under Plan C, could we summit for the 200, submit for the 200 beds if we can be flexible? Sure. So I'll um, see if I can answer that. And please feel free to uh, sort of resubmit a question if, if my answer doesn't hit on um, what you were getting at here. Um, so under Model A or Model B, um, we're sort of accepting. 
applicants who would be interested in operating those shelters at the city-owned facility, or if you have a facility that also has sort of capacity for over 200 beds, um, we would also welcome sort of those to be proposed under Model A or Model B. Um, one could also uh, apply under Model C there. Um, I will also note, you know, if if you apply under slightly the wrong model, we can we can consider um, the application under another one. Um, that will that will not be the the a barrier um, <laughs> to reading applications. So just to clarify, no specific ceiling for a proposal for a single organization, or can we feel free to list our total cost? Yes, no specific ceiling um, in terms of bed or budget for a single organization. Um, can we feel free to list our total cost? Yes, I mean, I, I think, um, we're interested in, you know, the cost of actually operating um, these programs. You know, this is also a com competitive application process. Um, so we'll we'll be looking at, you know, who can who can operate this at, at a reasonable budget. Will model B allow for intact families? Yep, great question. So um, yes, definitely to intact families. Um, whenever we say families, we want um, that to mean individuals of any gender identity, um, and we'll also sort of reiterate programs must practice family preservation um, by accepting and keeping together families of all sizes, ages, and gender identities. Hi, Kim, this is Tom. I just, I see that there's a trying to mark off the uh, answers to the questions. Did you answer the question? I'm sorry if you did about supportive services and case management to help the homeless navigate through systems. Yes, um, and I can quickly okay. reiterate. Um, so this application specifically is not uh, looking for sort of exclusively supportive services. Um, we're looking for shelter operators who will have supportive services and case management as part of uh, the services they're providing. Great, thanks. There's another question that just came in. Okay. So confirming that under Model B, families can include men with children. Yes. Oh, uh, your audio went out. Can you repeat that? Sure. <laughs> Model B families can include men with children. Okay. Are there resources about your budget process that we can access? So is there any sort of training or, or webinar, you know, not webinar, but like any kind of handouts that we have about the budget process? I'm not process, aware of any. Yeah, I'm not aware of any. By budget process, do you mean vouchering post-contract or just building a budget for an application, Mr. Johnson? Both. So post-contract, there is training on how to voucher, how to, there is training, and that is that, that's, that is um, done by OBM and is operated monthly. There are webinars on how to process vouchers, how to process, you know, how to, how to get your vouchers approved and what the system looks like. In terms of building out an application, we don't have any specific training. There are instructions that talk about, that are uploaded as part of the application packet. There are instructions to the budget template that we submit that talk about how, what, what each, um, budget sort of bucket is, you know, when, when we say personnel, what do we really mean? When we say contracted services, what do we really mean? And our budgets really follow the stand, standard sort of governmental accounting model. Um, in terms of doing the cost proposal, it's looked, when I reviewed it, it seems fairly self-explanatory. You really can't fill in a whole lot of boxes. 
you know, with the with the cost proposal, most of the stuff that you need to fill in is is you know everything else is password protected. But if you have specific questions about the cost proposal, you would talk to Kim. Um, specific questions about the budget, you're gonna just it's it's a standard budget. It looks like every other budget that your organization has probably submitted or whatever you're you know I'm sure that as a operating business or an operating nonprofit, you have a budget that you prepared for board meetings. And so it's just building out the budget like that. If you have a specific question about, about your budget, you can either call me or Kim and maybe we can give you some guidance, but it's mostly just figuring out how, what your program costs are and how, how that, that plays out. I'm not sure if there really are any wrong answers, except as was indicated in the PowerPoint and is all over the RFP document itself, we do look for reasonableness and costs. And by reasonable, we mean what is sort of, you know, affordable, neither, new, neither too high nor too low. Or if it's too low you're, or too high, giving us very good reasoning as to what you have done to, what has built into that, gone to building that number. I hope that explains. Kim, do you have anything to add? Nope, that was great. Okay, so it looks like that is all of the questions. I um, want to reiterate if you have sort of other questions that come up, um, please feel free to email um, me or Julia um, at the uh, email addresses listed on the slide. Um, and we will share out uh, responses to those questions to um, all applicants. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, really appreciate your time um, and look forward to seeing some of you at site visits tomorrow. There's one final question. Are there any special license, licensings with DCFS for having children? I, I'm not sure I fully understand this question, um, but no. Um, and please feel free to submit a sort of a additional question if, if there's something I'm missing there. All right, that's all the questions that I see. So again, I thanks everyone for participating and joining us in this webinar. It was a great webinar. Thanks, Kim and Julia, for everything that you did. And we'll be signing off right now. Thanks, all. Thank you.